Temporal Fencing and Life Fields One lifetime happens within a limited region of space and time. We have a rough idea of the temporal fencing that bounds it, and most of us expect to live less than another hundred years. That brings us to the single and double digits as we measure our temporal fencing. And life is always uncertain, so the remaining time may be even less than the expected one or two digit number. Many people, especially naive materialists, assume their life is confined to a single incarnation. They may find the ever-shrinking smallness of the temporal fencing surrounding their present incarnation claustrophobic and depressing. When I was growing up in New York City, there were frequent ads for Schlitz beer that would show something like a self-satisfied middle-aged guy smoking a cigar, wearing a yachtsman's cap on the deck of a boat with a couple of bikini-clad women doting on him. The voiceovers were variations of, you only go around once in this old world, so you better grab for all the gusto you can. And I tried to find, this was the closest one of those ads I could find, and through the miracle of iPad technology plus a total laziness on my part to do any video editing, um, here it is. Then you spot him. Tuna! And you better get him while they're running. Because you get no second chance. All the gusto in the world's out there. And now is the time to get it. You only get one crack at life. So you look for all the gusto you can. The life you live, the work you do, even in the beer you drink. When you're out of Schlitz, you're out of beer. Okay, so, um, everything is a lie. You're out of Schlitz, so you're out of beer? You gotta be kidding me. As if there weren't a better beer out there somewhere, huh? Um, but notice, notice the uh, theological, the, the existential uh, claims. There's a whole religion, a whole bankrupt religion in that ad. You only get one crack at life. And so you've got to grab for all the gusto. So uh, it's an entire religion in one sentence. You only go around once. In other words, there's no reincarnation. But much of the world believes in reincarnation, and there are at least 2,500 impeccably documented and highly evidential cases strongly suggestive of reincarnation. And when I say strongly suggestive, it's only because when there's something paranormal happens, we can never eliminate other paranormal exotic vectors, like, okay, maybe this kid tapped into like some Akashic record of universal consciousness that created the illusion that they lived a previous life. But in some of these cases, they will give addresses, phone numbers, s totally specific details that they couldn't even look up with access to libraries or internet about their previous life. And so uh, in the card, you'll see I put in, put in some links where you can read articles from Psychology Today and somewhere else about um, uh, giving, giving you a summary of some of that evidence. Uh, and so once again, can't rule out other exotic paranormal things, but from the point of view of competitive plausibility and even Occam's razor, a.k.a. the law of parsimony, uh, it is the, the simplest and um, most satisfying and encompassing explanation of this phenomenon of childhood recall of the very extreme specifics of mundane previous lives. Not as some would claim where they remember being Cleopatra or something like that. They're usually completely um, uh, ordinary lives um, remembered with an extreme specificity of detail in these very strong cases. Many ads manufacture suffering to promote a product as the remedy. This is a bit of a tangent, but it has some relevance. 
For example, ads for Sertz breath mints sometimes showed a teenage boy getting rejected by a girl because he had undetected bad breath. And then, you know, once he, you know, the helpful solution was, was of course, to have a mouthful of chemically perfumed candy with the magic chemical retsin in it. And then, then you see him winning the girl. So this was the closest I could find. These ads were just ubiquitous when I was growing up. So, and the idea is just to make you fear that you have, uh, and they would give it names like heliotosis and like, that you have bad breath or you have body odor and you know obviously some people do have bad breath but they need to like figure out what kind of garbage they're eating or like if they have some kind of problem with their lower intestines or something it's uh, they, they they should not need a mouthful of chemically perfumed candy to repair the problem okay so let's go to the uh search breath mint ad here oops close up no, no. This is an annoying thing with um, YouTube where they're constantly trying to force you to watch something else. Hold on to your attention. All right, let's get this together. This is a sophisticated technological way to do it. So. Will he kiss you again? Be certain with certs. New certs, the delicious tasting candy mint that makes your breath as sweet as your smile. It's a delicious candy mint. The perfect breath mint, too. Certs is two. Two. Two mints in one. Certs contains a sparkling drop of Retsin, the miracle breath purifier that stops bad breath. With Certs, if he kissed you once, he'll kiss you again. Be certain with Certs. Certs makes your breath as sweet as your smile. Okay. Be certain with Certs. So do you see the implication there? In other words, without certs, then you live in a universe of uncertainty and social and the, and the extreme possibility of devastating social rejection. Um, but thanks to the chemical retsin, um, you can achieve certainty. So this is what ads do is they're constantly um, manipulating us and on in a, in a vast way, um, and manipulating um, how we think about life itself and things that are extremely important, like social interactions. In recent years, the Vile Loom Company, L-U-M-E, company that I hate with the passion of a thousand white hot stars for their commercials, that where they have this woman who, who where they in these carefully engineered commercials where they. Uh, pretend as if it were filmed on a little phone or something to make it sound like she's just trying to, it's just a real person trying to give you this helpful tip. And what is the helpful tip that Loom uh, wants to sell you on? Um, it seeks to persuade you that you need to cover the entire surface of your body with chemical deodorants to be presentable. And with all kinds of disgusting, as if like being like helpfully candid references to like body parts and you know that that I don't feel like hearing about when maybe I'm like trying to eat or whatever and um, these super annoying ads come up. Schlitz ads reject the possibility of reincarnation to increase existential anxiety. Then they offer an encompassing solution to be a greedy hedonist grabbing all the short-term pleasure you can, especially Schlitz beer. You gotta. So what do you do? You only go around once. So what you should you should do with that existential anxiety? Grab for all the gusto. Be a selfish hedonist, obviously, which is great for consumer culture. You'll buy more stuff. Contemporary forces manufacture suffering with the assumption of a single incarnation to promote nihilistic materialism and hedonism. Like the bumper sticker, he who dies with the most toys wins. Consumer culture's answer to the dread ticking of the clock, shop till you drop. The fear of an ever more confining temporal life fence can be used to motivate all sorts of inferior behavior. On the other hand, the sense that this particular lifetime is a limited opportunity can also motivate ethical and meaningful use of time. The shortcut to this perspective is asking yourself the question, 
what will I remember well on my deathbed? But many of us know that fences are leaky, rickety boundaries, and souls are going over and through them, descending into fenced-in areas and ascending above them all the time. Good fences make good neighbors, said Robert Frost in The Mending Wall. Fences are sometimes there for our benefit. They mark useful boundaries. Good fences can make good life fields. Be fully engaged with the present day field by focusing on doing your best between awakening and bedtime. And I think I got that from uh, Dale Carnegie, um, whose name he's, you know, I always thought, oh, this is some corny, you know, I thought he was like a Norman Vincent Peale type. That was the minister that Donald Trump grew up listening to. But actually, he was somebody who like lived in China and studied Taoism. And he had some very useful um, tips. Um, like he pointed out that uh, there used to be a lot of ocean going fatalities. You know, people glamorized what it was like to be in a, a ship in the past. And as one person compared it to like being in prison with the high possibility of drowning thrown into the bargain. And the ships weren't stable so you constantly getting seasickness and 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 stuff like that it was a, you know um but <clears throat> uh, where they really improved the the safeness of the safety of uh, ocean going travel was when they put in water tight bulkheads uh into the hull so that if, if it hit an iceberg or something penetrated the hull that one bulkhead would fill up with water but uh, the whole ship wouldn't sink. It wouldn't just, you know, otherwise you would just have, before that, you just get one hole. And now, like, the whole ship fills up with water and everybody's dead in most cases. So, uh, now the Titanic had those water-type bulkheads, but the iceberg ripped through a critical number of them. Uh, so, so that it was inevitable that it was going to lose its buoyancy in 90 minutes or something. But, um, but what Dale Carnegie said is to live in day-tight compartments. In other words, instead of worrying about the next 50 years of your life or whatever, just worry about today. Live in a day-tight compartment. Focus, because that is your day field. Focus on doing the best you can from awakening to bedtime. It's a very centering focus. Awareness of the temporal fencing around your present life field can make you more conscious of what you are growing in that life field right now. Okay, this is a quote from um, Chaim Potix, The Chosen. In it, there's a, a, a man who's a rabbi who's explaining to his son, he has a serious heart condition, but he wants to make extreme efforts working around the clock to save Jews from the Holocaust, but his son is telling him, you know, you need to slow down. You've got this heart condition. And, but the father realizes it doesn't matter because the, what I'm doing is so morally significant. And so the father says to his son, the blink of an eye in itself is nothing, but the eye that blinks, that is something. A span of life is nothing, but the man who lives that span, he is something. He can fill that tiny span with meaning, so its quality is immeasurable, though its quantity may be insignificant. So that is a... So there's an example from something, not an advertisement, something I recommend much more highly, a novel. Think about the... the evolutionary milestone that novels were that an animal could create this intense inner experience that you can through like a telepathic technology upload into your mind read my novel parallel journeys please but um there, there's a whole life philosophy in these like two or three sentences so this book meets the definition i once heard somebody said stories should be equipment for living whereas ads are like Equipment for somebody profiting on your suffering. So the size of your life field is not anywhere near as significant as what you are growing there. The eye that blinks. What are you growing there? If that seems hard to answer, then you are not being honest with yourself. What you are growing is what you spend time on. 
The day field is a microcosm of the life field. Each day has its awakenings, its dream times, and its moments of oblivion. Temporal fencing marks a boundary between waking birth and sleeping dying, a boundary that's as useful as the seasons. Each of your day fields has an eternal significance. Your body has about 50 trillion cells, but today, the entire human species consists of just 8 billion day fields. 8 billion is actually not a very large number. I've got a, recording this on an iPhone 16 Pro Max, and, and one chip has something like 40 billion transistors in it. One human day field is a fairly substantial amount of tissue in the larger body. In the day field of the entire human species, if the day field of the entire human species were a single body, your one individual day field would comprise 3,750 cells. Today you will grow things, and tomorrow, if it comes, you will grow more things. Even when you are still, you grow thoughts and feelings. For example, even if you aren't a perfect meditator, you grow awareness during the practice, and this psychic foliage shifts the collective field of human consciousness. And the meditation doesn't always have to be silent. Like, for example, if you sign on to the zaporacle.com website, the website will pick a single oracle card for you. So you could also begin a day by just meditating on that one card, uh, most of which you could listen to because they have videos now. What sorts of thoughts and feelings are you growing in your life field? What sorts of relationships are you growing? Are they growing? Plants grow, wither, grow, wither. Is there more withering or growing in your life field? Your thoughts and feelings, their growth and wither cycles, often determine the growth and wither cycles of relationships and other key endeavors. A rewarding focus, therefore, is the daily harvest of thoughts and feelings you're growing. Many of the things growing in your life field are primary or secondary growths of your thought-feeling harvest. How many of the thoughts and feelings growing in your life field are your individual harvest, and how many are sourced from the rampant collective psychosis that has long plagued the human species? Revising this card in Boulder, Colorado in 2024, I see a growing collective psychosis on both the left and the right in this country. Don't allow the hell spawn harvest of collective psychosis to emerge from your life field. What you grow is not entirely controlled by fencing. Throughout our lives, we have a succession of full day fields before us. Whatever we grow in those day fields has, as Whitehead put it, the formality of actually existing. It doesn't, and that includes your thoughts and feelings. They all have the formality of actually existing. Existing, No matter how trivial they might seem, they are factual actualities. You thought of that specific thing and no other at that specific moment. It doesn't matter if your existence medium is a simulated matrix, a flickering hologram, or the dream time. Outside the perspective of linear time fencing, if something has ever existed, it always exists. It lives in eternity. Fences leave huge open boundaries under the endless sky of eternity. What we grow in our life field has an eternal significance. Be aware of fences, but focus on what you are growing out into eternity. Woe to the person who abandons their day field, seize and grow your day field.